Okay. If you would open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. This will be our main text. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. And I also will read a parallel text that goes with this in Luke chapter 6. But we'll start off with Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 29. I titled this message this morning, The Foundation of Our Life. And really this week I'd been praying about what the Lord wanted me to share this Sunday. And on Tuesday I had prayer. I, I, we had prayer on Tuesday and in and, and there I shared a little bit of this scripture. I didn't, I didn't go in depth like this, but I just talked about how the Lord was putting it on my heart. And I felt like the Lord really wanted me to touch on and talk about our foundation. You know, a foundation is probably the most important thing. I'm going to read something here in a minute um, that, that I found online that talks about a foundation uh, for a building or for a, a space or something of that nature and how important that is. I think we sometimes take for granted the foundation because we look at the walls and we look at all the aesthetics and we look at all the things you know that we put. It, 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 a lot of times we're not looking at the ground. We're looking up, we're looking around us. You know, if we, if we hung a banner, I wouldn't hang a banner on the ground, right? I would hang a banner on the wall. And I think sometimes we could take for granted the foundation that we could have in different areas of our lives. And so this main text, this is Jesus. To give context, Jesus had just, he's, he's really concluding the Sermon on the Mount. Which, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, man, talk about a sermon. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful time of teaching. Jesus is teaching to thousands of people. And he touches on many different things. And a lot of those things have to do with how we live our lives as Christians. I mean, he talks about from hating people, hating our enemies. He talks about from worrying about things in our life. He talks about the kingdom of God. He talks about, you know, the Beatitudes. He talks about so many different things. I, I couldn't touch on all of them and have enough time. But he's kind of concluding his, his message. And he says these important words to the people that are in front of him. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse 24. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority not as a scribe. So now I want to look at the parallel text because it's said in a different way. And, I, and I, I want both of these texts to be read because it really allows you to understand what Jesus is trying to communicate at the end of his message here. So in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 46, he says this, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, do, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man, uh, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and it could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. My question to you this morning is this, what type of foundation do you have in your life and what type of foundation is in the lives or in the life of your family? What is your foundation? What is your foundation built on. Now, I told you I was going to share a little illustration or a little quote that I found online from a, a website had to do with construction. And, 
and it gave a really good answer or really kind of good detailed perspective on the purpose of a foundation. And this is what it says. It says, the purpose of a foundation. It says, your foundation does much more than simply hold your house on it. You see, we sometimes begin to think about a foundation in, in one way. Well, the, yeah, I need the foundation because when I have the foundation, it allows me to put everything else on it. And that's kind of how we view it. And we keep a one-track thought mindset. But then this person wrote on to say, a good foundation keeps moisture out. It resists any movement of the ground. And it insulates against the cold. A foundation must be strong enough to support the load of the entire building. A well-built foundation keeps the occupants safe from normal weather and from natural disasters such as earthquakes and floods. So today I want to talk about our foundation as Christians and how our foundation has to be in Jesus. If your foundation is not in Jesus, but it's in church, it's in church socializing, or it's in, um, I'm trying to think of, of, of the word, in a religious aspect and it's not in Jesus. You know, Jesus even said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, many in the end, in this same chapter, seven, he said, many in the last days will say, Lord, Lord, did I not do this in your name? Did I not raise the dead in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not heal the sick? They have these list of things that people who said they knew, you know, did and knew Jesus, what they did for his kingdom, and his response, and I'm paraphrasing, his response was this, but I never knew you. You see, they had a false sense of their foundation. And like I just read, this person said, a foundation has to be strong. You know, you could have a foundation that isn't strong. You could have a foundation, like Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, that was built on the earth and it'll crumble. Whatever you put on it will fall and crumble. So as Christians, we have to know that our foundation has to be in Jesus. And my first point this morning is this. Jesus is the only one that gives us a new foundation. It's only Jesus. He's the only one that can set a new foundation for your life. Not a man, not a 10-step program book. You know, we got plenty of those today, man. You can go to the bookshelf and it's just like how to fix your marriage in four ways. How to, you know, fix your finances in 20 ways. There's all these different ways of doing things. But I want to declare to you this morning that there's only one person, and that is Jesus Christ, who can give you a new foundation. He's the only one. He said that. He said, whoever comes to me. So I have to, I come to Jesus and then he says, and here's my sayings. So I hear what he's speaking to me through his word, through his Holy Spirit. And then he says, and does them, I will show you whom he is like. So whoever comes to him, hears what he's saying, and then actually lives it out and does it according to faith. Jesus says, I'll show you who he's like. He's like a man who built his house on a rock on a strong foundation, and that rock is Jesus Christ. That foundation is Jesus Christ. To have a new foundation, you have to first come to the one who can give you that foundation. Before Christ, each and every one of us, I want you to think about if you are a Christian in this place, before Christ, every one of us, and those of you who may not know Christ in this room, think about your life right now in this moment. Those of you who may be watching online, your foundation that you had built on your own, on your ability, on your thoughts, on your emotions, on your desires, it was completely flawed. There were so many flaws in it. So many flaws. So many things that needed to be fixed. Those flaws were seen, most importantly, in what? In our sinfulness, our sinful nature. I mean, I think about my life. I can only testify for myself I can't testify for anyone else, but when I testify for myself, I think about my life and I think I had built my foundation on drugs, on immorality, and on sheer wickedness. And 
I had this crazy, I'll share this, this, this goes along with this. I had this crazy moment when I was 18. This was three months before I was about to go to college to play basketball on a scholarship. And as I was sitting there, I was at a party with a lot of people. We were indulging in alcohol. You're underage. Yeah, I was a sinner. Um, we were indulging in all sorts of just immorality. We were doing drugs. We were doing all sorts of crazy things. And there was a girl there. And I don't know whether or not she was a Christian or not. And I believe she was. But I don't think she was there because she was wanting to party. I think her friends were like, hey, you should come hang out. And then she got there and was like, this is not my scene. But she came up to me out of nowhere and she pointed at me. And it was like a defining moment. It was weird. I never experienced anything like this in my life. I'm sitting at a table surrounded by guys and she points me out and she points at me and she looks at me and she says, you will lose everything. You will lose your scholarship. You will lose all of what you've worked for and your life will be in crumbles if you do not stop doing what you're doing. And she walked away. And I started laughing. Because, you know, I'm smarter than God. You know? <laughs> Who, who's this chick? I'm like, who in the world is this girl? Coming out of nowhere telling me I'm going to fail. And her point was, she was pointing out my sin. She was pointing out my problems. But you see, I didn't have a foundation in Jesus. I had a foundation in myself. So I said, what does this girl know? She doesn't know anything. I'll be fine. I'm going to get my life taken care of. I have, you know, two months. I'll stop doing drugs. I'll stop doing all that. I'll go to school. I'll be great. I'll be fine. See, I wasn't recognizing that my sinful nature was my foundation. That I had built my life on the lies that sin had told me. That I had built my life on the desires to do what was simply wrong against holy God. That though I had learned that from other people, we, you know, come on, be real. People learn how to sin even from what's around them, what they see. The people they hang out with, even though those things are, are ways to learn how sin can be influential in our lives, we still have to understand that our foundation without Christ is fleshly. It's evil, it's sinful, it's wicked at the very core. And really, there's no way to set yourself free from it. And how do you know that? Well, I, I was watching a, a documentary recently about a, a, an athlete who had struggled with addiction. And during his time being an athlete professionally, he had stopped drinking. His problem was he was addicted to alcohol. And he had stopped drinking, but something happened. He said, when I stopped drinking, I had to replace it with something. And what that tells me is this. Your flesh can never save you from your flesh. Because the way he replaced it was he started to indulge and sugar, and sweets, and different things of that nature. So when he would feel the urge to drink, he would start eating M&Ms and ice cream, and he would eat all these things. Why? Because he's trying to fill and replace what his flesh wasn't getting with more fleshliness. And by the end of it, he was back into his alcoholic addiction. And even to this day, he still has other vices that he can't get rid of because why? Because the flesh doesn't profit anything. It cannot save you. It cannot keep you. It cannot free you. It cannot redeem you. It's at its core. It's evil. It's wicked. Only Jesus Christ, only the Son of God can free you from yourself. And he gives you that new foundation. Jesus declared to the people that he saw before him, he declared to them that if they would come to him, that if they would hear him, and that if they would do what he was asking them to do, they would be the man who built his foundation on the rock. That's what their outcome would be. They wouldn't end up like the other man. You see, there's a decision that we have to make. And the only way that we, as human beings, can have a new foundation, can have freedom, forgiveness, new life, set free from our sinfulness, from our wickedness, 
is being redeemed by God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. No other way will work. I don't care if you tell me, oh, well, I, I do this. No, I'm telling you, it won't work. You'll always be profiting the flesh because only Jesus can bring us into his spirit. Only him. Only he can give us the Holy Spirit and give us freedom through his blood. Listen to this psalm. This is Psalm 40. And we're going to read some verses today. So wake up, everybody. Wake up. Be awake. Everyone's like, I know it's hot. It's really hot. But I need you to wake up. Be awake. We're going to read a lot of scripture because we need that as Christians. It says in Psalms 40, verse 1, it says this is a psalm that David wrote. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and he set my feet on what? On a rock. He set his feet on a rock. You see, Jesus wants to set our feet on a rock. And that same rock, I believe David, and I believe he was referring to as that is that rock that Jesus was referring to. God, him. He set his feet upon a rock and established my, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, and your law is within my heart. He says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. Oh Lord, you yourself know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And that's what I say to you today. I am not trying to hide or conceal the truth. The truth is that Jesus is our only savior from this world and from our sin, from our filthy foundation that we build, that he's the only way for us to have a new foundation found on him. Only in him does he pick us up and set us on a new foundation, on a rock. Romans 1.16, and I said this to our youth this week. I said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. It's through the power of Jesus Christ and his salvation, his gospel, that we're given new life and a new foundation to live for him. He goes, it goes on to say, Paul says, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in the gospel, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'm unashamed that Jesus is the true son of God. We should not be ashamed to declare to the people around us that, hey, their foundation may not be the right foundation. We should not be ashamed to declare to those that we interact with on a daily basis that Jesus is the one who wants to give us new life that he died for us, that he was a sacrifice for us so that through him, through his gospel, we can be set free. We could be redeemed. Romans 3.23, for there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, we have to understand first that we're flawed before we can be fixed. I was listening to a minister the other day and he was talking about the importance of that today. People need to understand that they're sinners that on their own without Christ, there's only wickedness. We've become afraid to say this in the church because we're afraid to tell people that what they're doing is wrong. We're afraid to tell them that sin is bad and that they should not be indulging in it. And we're afraid of what they may think or if they'll come back. Or if they'll come, who, 
The point is, is not whether or not they're going to come back or what they think about us. The point is, just like David said, I'm not going to conceal it. I'm not going to hold it in. I'm going to speak the truth in the great assembly. Whether it be in this assembly or it be somewhere else, I'm going to speak that truth because that's the freedom that people need. It's in Christ. Romans chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. It says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus came for the most ungodly one of us. He came for us who are flawed. He came for us who are broken. He came for those who don't have the correct foundation. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. When we were at our worst and our foundation was at its weakest, when we were wrecked, when we were full of sin, Jesus said, I want to come and die for you. I want you at that state. I want you at that moment. I want to save you from that. He came for us and he's loved us and he continues to love those around us and he desires for them too. You know, I, t- I told the students on Wednesday, I said, guys, I said, it's great that you go to school and you give a kid a Bible, but if you don't explain it to him, he won't understand it or she won't understand it. I said, most kids, when you give them a book today, they're not gonna, you know, skip home. Woohoo! I'm gonna go home and read my book, you know? That's, that's not the mindset today. But when you hand them th- that book and you say, listen, In this is the gospel. In this is the truth. In this will set you free. And you explain it to them and you share it to them. It opens their heart. And they see who God is. They see that he came for them just like he came for us. He came so we could be set free. So we could be redeemed. God sent his son to make us new. To make us a new creation, right? In 2 Corinthians, I said God gives us a new, new foundation. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 5, 12 through 21. It says, for, for we do not commend ourselves again to you. This is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. But give, give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died and he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation and all things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God says, I reconcile you. That means he restores us to Christ. So God not only wants to give us a new foundation, but he wants to restore us to God through Jesus Christ. And then we have a new relationship. And then we can build upon that in our lives. And it's just simply, what? By our faith. You can't build your own foundation. Your foundation comes through Christ alone. He establishes it, and then you build off of it through him. And he builds off of it through you. You know, Paul, and I'm going to read the scripture in a moment, Paul talks about that in Ephesians. He talks about it in different areas of scripture, and I'm going to read those scriptures. We have to understand that as Christians, our job is not to try to build our own foundation, and this is really what the Lord put in my heart. I was praying again about this on Saturday, last Saturday, not yesterday, last Saturday, and when I was praying The Lord just showed me this. He showed me in my mind. It's like I saw two foundations. And one was the Lord's. One was what the Lord had established. And he had made it. And it was strong and it was secure. But the other was what man had established. And he showed me in in this prayer time. It was as, as if people, Christians today, were they were on the rock. They were on the firm foundation. And and. 
and the things that were happening were difficult, but they were standing firm. And then all of a sudden, they just got this idea that they should go build their own foundation. And they walked over and they started building their own foundation and they left the Lord's foundation. They left what God was calling them to. And they thought, well, I, I can make it look like that, but it won't be that because it's not built on him. And what are we seeing today in the church? We're seeing more Christians turn back from God than ever before, especially in America. I'm going to read a statistic to you that's going to blow your mind here in a minute. This was, and it's in an article that was posted by a Christian news you know, network that I believe is, is putting truth out. And they did a study about American Christians. This came out this past week. And I'm going to read it to you in a moment. And your, your, your mind is going to be blown by, by what this study has found within the church in America. But before we get to that, I want to get to this. Second point is this. They pull it up. The second point is Jesus is the only foundation that can support and hold us up. He's the only foundation. What did I say earlier? Foundation, it lay, it's laid, and then what's put on it? There's a weight that's put on it. You know, if we thought right now that, that this building is just that the foundation isn't, it doesn't have pressure on it, we'd be kidding ourselves. All of this weight is being put down on this. And you in your own self, you can't carry that. No way. You'll be crushed. You can't carry that weight. And if there's any Christian or maybe non-Christian who thinks that they themselves can hold all of the load of their sin, all of the load of the world, all of the load of just the enemy himself coming against them, and that they could support all of that and they can build on their own foundation, then they're wrong because it's impossible. It will crumble. Jesus is called what in scripture? You may say he's called a lot of things, but he's called something particular that, that relates to this. He's called the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone. In Mark 12, verses 10 and 11 he says, have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus is called the chief cornerstone. Now I wanna say this to you. What is a chief cornerstone? Does anyone in here know what a chief cornerstone is? Do you know what the purpose of a chief cornerstone is? Listen to the definition of, of what a chief cornerstone is, okay? Okay. It is the rock upon which the weight of the entire structure rests. The entire structure. Everything that's built on it, the weight of all of that is set on that cornerstone. So when Jesus is in our foundation, when he's not our cornerstone, we have nothing to hold us up. Absolutely nothing. Nothing to hold up our lives, and nothing to hold up the church. You know, there's churches where Jesus isn't the Lord in the church, and they're masquerading as churches. And that place is gonna crumble. You may say, well, Pastor Reese, why hasn't it yet? Oh, it will. When the judgment and wrath of God comes, you'll see it crumble. It will not last. And I wanna say this, because I've really felt this in my heart, is that we do not need to shy away from being real with people with the gospel. There, there is gonna be judgment upon every person. That's coming. I'm not trying to get all, you know, fire and brimstone. I'm, I'm being honest, you know? People don't preach on that. They don't preach that God's gonna judge them for their sin. They don't preach that if Jesus isn't their cornerstone, that instead of being a rock that saves, he'll be a rock that stumbles and they'll be crushed. That's what it says. We have to understand that Jesus has to be the one thing that holds us up in our lives. He has to be the one when all of the weight comes down, that's where it rests on. And trusting him. Listen to Ephesians chapter two. 
verse 19 through 22. It says, now therefore, this is Paul, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone. Jesus is that chief cornerstone, that foundation that everything sets on, in whom, what, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So not only are we personally growing and being built up, but the church as a body is being grown and built up. But Christ, if he's not the cornerstone, then it's gonna fall. That's why Jesus has to be the foundation for our lives. He has to be the foundation in our families. He has to be the foundation in the church. He has to be the foundation to everything. I don't care how you feel. I don't care how you think. I don't care if you've done every good deed on earth. That has nothing to do with it. The fact is, is that Jesus Christ has to be the foundation. And if he's not, I, I, is anybody awake in here? I can't tell. Come on now. <sighs> I didn't come here to, you know, just, just to, to sit in silence, man. I, I feel strong in my heart. The church right now is not in the right place. I'm not talking about this church. I'm saying the church in the entirety. We have shied away. We have made other things our foundation in this season. We've been putting more importance on what we want in our fleshliness and less importance on Jesus Christ. And, and that's why people are rocked. That's why people are just in total despair. That's why people are just crumbling. Because their foundation, it's not sure. It's built on their emotions. It's built on their needs. It's built on their sinful desires. It's built on, you know, what CNN says. Oh my gosh. And they, they live their life with, with Jesus not being the foundation. And then they wonder why it's so bad. They wonder why it's so bad. It blows my mind. You know, Jesus, he talked about two men in this, in this ending. He said there was a man that listened, he heard, and he did it, he obeyed it. But then there was another one. And the other one was the one who, guess what? He was, he was there for the sermon. He was sitting in the front row. It says, if we go back, it says in Luke chapter six, look at it in chapter six, he says, but he who heard and did nothing, he heard it. He heard how to have the good foundation. He knew what he needed. But guess what? He said, I'm good. I can do it myself. I don't need that. I, I, I know how to build it. I know how to handle it. I don't need God's help during this season of COVID. I don't need God's help with running my family. I don't need God's influence. I don't need him as a foundation for my marriage. No, 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 no. I could do it myself. And so he went out, what did he do? He tried to build on what he could make. And what does it say? It says he heard and he did nothing. And he's like a man who built a house on the earth and without a foundation. And when the streams beat against it. He didn't even hit a storm. A stream came along. He didn't even have any wind. Just a stream came and just, it immediately fell. That's what it says. And the ruin of that house was great. There's two choices here, church. There's two choices that we can make and only one really brings freedom and blessing and restoration and that's Jesus being our foundation. How many of you ever done this in your life? You got away from Jesus being your foundation. What happened? Oh, oh man, it was like a tornado just came through, right? Everything starts going left and right. Everything's going wrong. I was talking to someone recently and they were talking about how they wanted God's blessing in their life. This person's in my family. They want God's blessing in their life, but they don't want to give up sin. I just looked at them and said, you'll never get God's blessing. It doesn't matter how hard you're going to try. It, you'll never get it. Your foundation will never be secure. You'll always be longing for something else. And, and you'll never find it. Until we surrender. Until we hear 
We come and we obey. Then Jesus gives us the foundation. Then he gives us the security. My mom said this to me yesterday. I called her. I love my mom. She's such an encouragement to me. She said, son, when I wake up, I never worry about you. My mom lives in New Mexico. I don't get to see her a lot. And I said, really? You never worry about me? She said, no. And you want to know why? I said, why? She said, because I know your foundation's secure. I know your life's built on Jesus. And the Lord tells me every day not to worry. Because I know he's keeping you. I don't even worry. And it's true, she doesn't. She doesn't even worry. And that's because she understands that when you make God your foundation, not only was that for me, that was for her. She was making God her foundation, saying, God, I trust you, that you're gonna keep me, that you're gonna watch over me and you're gonna watch over my family. He keeps us secure. He doesn't allow us. He doesn't allow, what did I say earlier about what a foundation looks like? He doesn't allow the moisture to get in. He doesn't allow our hearts to get cold. When Jesus is our foundation, our heart can't get cold. You know why? Because if it starts through the Holy Spirit, he starts warming it up. He starts shaking us up. He starts stirring us up again. He keeps us from the ground when it around us gets shaky. It doesn't shake. It stays firm. He keeps us from the temptation. He keeps us from the struggle and he allows us to be strong. He keeps us strong through it. So when we're standing on him and we're secure in him and everything else around us is chaotic, we have peace and we have comfort. The third thing is this. With Jesus as my foundation, we have an eternal home waiting for us. Not only does Jesus become my foundation on this earth, he builds me a foundation in heaven. When Christ becomes my foundation, I have comfort and security here. But I also have comfort and security knowing that when I get to him, he'll have something for me there. What does he say? And we know, we know the scripture in John, John 14, verses one through seven. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself. So Jesus is saying, not only Will he make us like the sound man, the man who came to Jesus, he heard Jesus, he obeyed Jesus. Jesus is saying, not only will I bless that man or that woman who comes to me and lives for me with the foundation they can build on in their life now, he says when they get to the next life, when they enter in with me because they have been faithful, because they have obeyed me, because they have loved me and followed me, he says they won't even have to build it. I'll have it built for them already. I'll have it ready to go. As soon as they walk in, he'll take you right to it and say, I've made this for you. I made this for you. I had this for you. I prepared it for you. Listen to this statistic. This article, I think, is going to blow so many of minds. When I read it, I was broken. This is why we cannot let any else become our foundation. Jesus has to be our foundation. He has to be your foundation. He has to be. Listen to this article. A new survey shows that the majority of Americans no longer believe that Jesus is the path to salvation. And instead, they believe that being a good person is just sufficient. As part of the ongoing release of the Arizona Christian University-based Cultural Research Center American Worldwide View Inventory, the latest findings exploring perceptions of sin and salvation from George Barna, the group's director, shows that nearly two-thirds of Americans believe that having some kind of faith is more important than the particular faith with which someone aligns. 68% who embrace that notion identify as Christians. 
including 56% of self-described evangelicals and 62% of those who identify as Pentecostals, 67% of mainline Protestants and 77% of Catholics also embrace that idea. They embrace the idea that I don't need to submit to Jesus, that I don't need to make him my foundation, that I don't need to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. I just need to live a good life, give five bucks to the homeless guy, and always be kind, and I'll enter in. I don't need to address my sin, my evilness, my wickedness as a human being. I don't need to address the fact that I need a savior. I don't need any of that as long as I'm good. Listen to this. Slightly over half of Christians respondents said, They believe someone can attain salvation by being good or doing good. 50% of Christians. That's totally against the word of God. Do you understand? The word of God does not say that. And people are believing this. And churches, some churches, I'm not going to name names, but churches are putting that out. In addition to the viewpoint That eternal salvation can be earned. Survey results show that 58% of Americans believe that no absolute moral truth exists. (laughs) And that the basis of truth are factors of sources other than God. 58% of Americans. That's including Christians and (laughs) non-Christians. 77% said that the right and wrong is determined by factors other than the Bible. And you're telling me we don't need a world that needs Jesus as the foundation? We gotta wake up, church. We're living in a new world. This world is not like what some of the you know, elderly and elders in this church grew up in. And I'm, I hate to say that. And I'm thankful for your faith and for your life. But we're in something completely different. Completely different. He says 59% said that the Bible is not God's authoritative and true word. And 69% said that people just need to be basically good. (laughs) People are dying and going to hell without even a a drop of fear. I feel so bad. Can you imagine how many people are at the, uh, they come before Christ? (sighs) That makes me think of Nicodemus the story that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the most religious men there was. Nicodemus thought he had it all together and he was good to go. And he had a a lame man that sat out in front of his his gate. He walked by every day, he wouldn't even care. The dogs would lick his sores, that's what scripture says. And they both die. The lame man's in Abraham's bosom in heaven and Nicodemus is burning in hell. I wonder how many Nicodemuses there are that go into the church and think, I just need to be a good, nice person. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to believe in the gospel. I don't have to surrender my life. When I just read scripture that talked about from the apostle Paul, how he gave his life, so now we give our life. And people just accept it. I'm not here to, you know, um, I don't want to say it pats me on the back. I'm here to be real and honest. And if I've stepped on anyone's toes in here, I, I'm sorry, I don't apologize for that because maybe you needed that. And, and I'm not, I don't mean that in a rude way. I mean that in a, a loving way. Like, I love you. I love you. I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to have a false salvation and think that, oh, I don't need Christ as my foundation. I could do my own thing. And then you go through life and then on the day of judgment, when you die or when Christ returns, (laughs) you're out of it, bud. And you never believed what the true truth was. That the only way to salvation is through the life given by Jesus Christ, through him and we do that in faith. People talking about good works, good works don't amount to anything. You will run yourself into the dirt trying to do good works. Good works are not what it's about. It's about faith. It's about putting your faith in Jesus. Listen to this, Ephesians chapter two, verses four through 10. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's by God's grace and our faith being put in him. And it says, in that, not of yourselves. It's not us. It's not our good works. I declare to you today, being saved, having salvation, forgiveness of sin, being restored to God in relationship, becoming a true Christian has nothing to do with how much you can do. It simply has to start with you believing in faith, in your heart, and giving yourself to Christ in faith. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. How prideful are we to say that we get our own. Well, we'll uh, you don't have to punch my ticket, Jesus. I'll punch my own. I can do it myself. Again, what did I say? Flesh profits nothing. It's flesh feeding the flesh. We don't want to admit that we're wrong and that we need Jesus to come and save us. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's by grace that we're saved. It's by God's grace that he would even allow us to have a foundation in Jesus Christ. He could have just said, forget it. But he didn't. He didn't say that. Tori, if you could come. We're almost finished. My heart is burdened, church, because from what I just read to you, the statistics, now that was statistics with Christians and non-Christians, okay? So don't just think, oh, that was all Christians. That was both. It alarms me because there's too many people that think that's perfectly okay. Okay that they don't need to acknowledge the fact that Christ has to be their foundation in their life. That they could just go, do good things and have their way and, and you know, they don't have to sacrifice anything. You know, I was sharing something with my wife this morning when we were coming in. You know, we were talking about in, you know, in, the, in the Old Testament, you know, the story of Hannah. It's, it's, it's a happy story, you know, but it's, it's a sad story too, you know. It's sad because Hannah couldn't have children, you know? And she had tried for so long and she couldn't have kids and she would pray and pray and pray. And then one day she prayed the prayer, this prayer. And you see a lot of people that when they look at that prayer, I think sometimes they look at the fact that her prayer was answered in the sense that she had a child but they forget what the cost was. There was a cost. When she got on her knees and she said a prayer with no words because she was praying so hard in her heart to God that even the priest came to her and said, thought, you know, he thought she was under the influence. He thought, he, he th he thought she was drunk, but he didn't realize she was praying so hard in such a way, she didn't want any man to hear what she was saying to God. And she prayed a prayer, but she didn't pray a prayer. Oh God, just give me a kid. Thank you. There was sacrifice in the prayer. She said, Lord, and I'm paraphrasing. If you give me a child, I'm going to give him to you. I won't even keep him. Just give me a child. Think about that. She wanted a kid so bad, she would sacrifice the opportunity to see him go from a baby to a grown man. And God saw that. And he answered the prayer. And it said that when Samuel was of the age, she took him to the temple and she left him there. 
And I'm sure they, they saw each other, but it wasn't all the time. And then it went on to say that she had many more children. Why did I say all that? Pastor Reese, what does that have to do with anything? There was a sacrifice. She sacrificed the opportunity to have what she fully wanted for God. Are we willing to sacrifice what we want and say, God, I give it all to you. I make you my foundation. I make you my everything. I'm not gonna build anything on my own. It's not about what I can do or how I feel or how I think. It's not about what my family thinks. It's not about what my mom and dad may think. It's not about what the world and my friends think. It's simply about you. I'm all in. And when we do that, God sees the sacrifice and he says, I'm gonna protect you. I'm gonna keep you. I'm gonna guide you. It's gonna be difficult. You're gonna go through the storms. You're gonna go, you're gonna have the the river beat against your, your foundation in your home. You're gonna have the trials, but guess what? I'm gonna see you through every single one of them and you're gonna stand on me in the end. And not only Will it be for you? But all those looking around you will see your foundation and go, how is he still standing? How is he still there? I mean, we got to think about it in perspective. Jesus is talking about people building a home. Imagine if you saw a home in a neighborhood that was totally untouched and a flood came through and destroyed every other home. I'd be going to that guy going, um, excuse me, sir. What, what, what did you put in this house? Like... You know, four tornadoes hit this one street and your house has nothing missing. How is this possible? And he smiles and says, my foundation is built on Jesus. It's not built on me. I actually didn't even do anything. I just trusted God with all of my heart. And I put my faith in him and I built my life on him. And every time something would come, he would help me. And you know what? I did get scared. Sometimes I huddled down in the bathroom and I got in the bathtub and I thought, oh Lord. But then he reminded me that he was going to keep me. And I didn't worry and I didn't fear. You see, God's calling us to build our lives that way, but he's calling the church to build their lives that way. Because when the stuff gets really tough, we haven't hit it in America. In China, it's so sad. In China, they're making the Christians kneel and bow and pray to the president of China. And if they don't, they kill them, they beat them. We have it easy. Yet we don't even do it. Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord. But you don't even do what I say. Yet you want my foundation? Yet you want to be built on me? There's sacrifice. We have to sacrifice as the church. We have to be all in. Yes, God frees us and redeems us and he saves us and it's beautiful. But there's something after that and he calls us to and we have to live our lives through him. We can't miss that. We can't start on his foundation and then decide to go build somewhere else won't work won't work you'll come running like the prodigal son right back to it because you'll know amen let's stand as we conclude let's pray I don't know how many of you may have been touched by this message and to be quite honest with you I never go into a message looking for that you know why because then I'm looking for something that I did I'm not I'm not looking for that Whether this spoke to you or not, I pray this, and I wanna pray this over all of you, that you would make Jesus your foundation in your life and in your home, that you would make him your one desire, that you would truly live for him. Because I'm not prophesying, I'm just saying things are not gonna get better right now. And why should we be afraid to acknowledge that? Think positive, think positive, think positive. No, it's okay, it's okay if things aren't always perfectly positive. Because we have a God that controls the positive and the negative, and I'm not worried about it. But if I don't keep my faith, and if I don't continue to make him my foundation, well, I shouldn't be surprised when everything falls around me. Because that's what he said it would do. That's what he said. 
Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for every person here, God. And God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for every man. God, life is, is a beautiful thing. The fact that we could be alive and not only made, but made in your image and kept by you. And God, you desire the most wicked amongst us and the most righteous. And Lord, I pray for your people. I pray for the church. I pray, God, that we would make you our foundation, Jesus. That Jesus, you would be the rock that we would stand on, that we would dig deep and we would seek you and we would draw near to you and we wouldn't veer left or right from you. And God, forgive us when we have. Forgive us when we started digging two feet from your foundation, trying to make something on our own. Lord, forgive us when we tried to do things on our own. God, we desire to build upon you and your foundation, Jesus. You are our cornerstone and we put our trust in you. You are the cornerstone of this church, Trinity Life Church. And we are going to put our faith and our hope and our trust and our love in you, Jesus. And we know that you're with us. And Lord, I pray today for anyone in this place who have, who have not, who, who hasn't made you their foundation that today they would come. They would come to the one who makes them a new creation. They would come to the one who gives them true life and freedom. And they would give their hearts to you today, Father. That they would seek you and cry out to you in prayer and give all of their lives to you. And God, I pray that you would keep those who have been devoted to you. That right now may be in a storm. And they're in the bathtub. And they're scared. God, remind them that you're the foundation that they're on. That you're not going to let them fall. That you're going to keep them and you're gonna get them through that storm. And I pray that they would be encouraged today, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you so much that we rely on you and that you love us and keep us. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Well, be blessed, church. You'll have a great rest of your beginning of your week and continue to tell others about Jesus. Amen, amen.